So, if, if you don't mind, let me go back and hear. You have such an amazing story, Tracy. Um, so many people appreciate your testimony because they've been down dark alleys like you have. Before Flyleaf, what was what was going on inside of your head? What was your world like before you became the lead singer of this great rock band? Well, I um, I grew up in Texas, and my mother was a musician, and she she always kind of pursued that, but also um, had some rocky paths that she had to face as well, and we ended up um, just in poverty, uh, not not knowing where our next meal was coming from or where we were going to stay, and my mother was a single mom, and, and at one point there were six of us, and and then just the, and she had me when she was 16, my brother when she was 15, and so just the dynamics of just the circumstances were were heavy and difficult. And but she always talked to us about God, and you know I saw her give our food stamps away to the babysitter. She couldn't pay them, so she could have a job and make some money. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but then it seemed like there was always like the car would break down or something, and we wouldn't. The money would just there was just no money and no food and um, and she would and actually when she would give the money away I would think well how what how are we gonna get groceries and she would look at me and she God will feed us and she'd get mad at me like stop stop questioning that you know God's gonna take care of us and the truth is He did um, and I saw that um, so I believed in God but when I was ten years old um, I had a I had a tra- tragedy happen in our family my three-year-old cousin who was really close to our family was beaten to death by his stepfather and I at 10 years old not knowing how to process that very well just thought I'm either going to think that God is evil for not protecting him or he's not real and so I decided I wasn't going to believe in God anymore and became an atheist at 10 so um, at the same time that I had that happened I also kept wondering why wasn't me like how come I'm I'm alive and he's not and and I thought um well I'm just gonna be sad for him all the time that'll be my loyalty to him and um and I just decided I was gonna just stay in this sad place and um it's such a weird thing to think about because I did I probably needed counseling you know like how to process mourning and whatever but I, and, and have that so that was my reaction and and became addicted to sadness. And as weird as that sounds, like if there was nothing sad in my life going on, I would be sad about other things going on. And I hated people that were happy because I thought, how can you be happy in a world where children get beaten to death and all these horrible things happen? And I just um, thought it was fake and naive. And um, so I was drawn to dark things. I was drawn to um, to people who dealt with pain similar to the way I did and the same reaction. And you know, got into drugs and relationships that were very shallow. And whenever I would get into a, a real relationship accidentally, like where it was really loving, and I would cling on to it and make it into a God because I didn't believe in God. So this was the closest I could get. And of course, it's too much weight to put on somebody to make them into a God because only God's God enough to be God. And so they would fail me, and my whole world would fall apart. And so that happened in the cycle until. You know, and also, if anybody told me something was a sin, I would say, I thought the idea of sin was to control people. And I was like, well, that's a sin. I'm going to go do it because you're not going to control me. And mm-hmm. that's kind of how right. the Bible says, though, the truth is that sin leads to death. And so inside, I was dying every like throughout this whole process. Yeah. And this led you into uh, down a road of, of depression. Right. right, and and even contemplating suicide. I thought about that all the time. I think I thought about it since my cousin's death, and and I cried myself to sleep every night, and um, and I think um, that was like a habit in a, in a way. This was a weird weird thing way to think about it, um, but when I look at it, I, that's how I see it. And so by the time I was 16, I was just tired of the pain in my heart and decided I didn't want to live anymore and um, planned to commit suicide. And by that time I had was kicked out of my mother's house and was living with my grandparents. And my grandmother came home. My grandfather had had a heart attack earlier that week, was in the hospital, and my grandmother um, was not supposed to be home. She was supposed to be in the hospital with my grandfather. And she was there and she looked at me and she just knew something was wrong with me. 
And she said, something's wrong, so you're going to go to church. I was like, I'm not going to church. I hate Christians. I hate that happy place where everybody always, you know, I don't, I don't want to go to church. And she said, you know what? You're in my house, and you're going to do what I say. And we got into this big screaming match. And um, she out screamed me, <laughs> whatever. And, um, she knows how to do it better than I do, apparently. So. And that's what I did for a living for a little while. <laughs> And, um, but in the end, she ended up just, uh, I, I said, I don't want to spend my last day on earth listening to her scream, so I'm going to go to church if you yeah. just be quiet. So I went, went, sit in the back of the room, hate everybody there, and the preacher starts to tell my life story like I'm the only one there. And after he gets to the end, he starts crying, and he, and the whole place is quiet because he's crying. And he says, there's a suicidal spirit in the room. And... <laughs> All the hair stood up on my head, and I was like, this is weird. And he says, please come up here and let us pray for you, because God has a plan for your life and doesn't want you to die tonight. And I was like, there's no way I'm going up there. There are all these Christians. I'm not doing it. My pride wouldn't let me go. And so I went to the um, door of the church, and a man stopped me there. And um, he spoke to me, and he said, I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you that even though you've never known an earthly father, that God will be a better father to you than any earthly father can ever be. And, um, and I thought, I don't need a dad. I never knew any dad, you know. And he said, and God has seen you when you cry yourself to sleep at night. And when he saw, said that, I was like, how could he say that? How could he know? You know, that's the loneliest part of my day. And, uh. and so I, I realized, you know, God was talking to me. <laughs> I just admitted it, you know, to myself. And he said, can I pray for you? so that God can take the pain out of your heart. And I said, okay. And he began to pray, and I felt the Holy Spirit wrap around me and knew that there was a God. <laughs> you know, as you're saying this, it makes me think of people like Robin Williams. It makes me think of so many other people that are in the news now, um, people that I've known, that I've worked with, friends and, and family who have suffered from mental health issues, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and um, you know, there, there could be somebody who's listening right now and going, Lacey, you're just, you know, like you're, you have no idea how what you're saying is parallel, parallel in my life right now. Mm -hmm. And you've written a book, mm -hmm. and this book is called uh, The Reason, How I Discovered a Life Worth Living. Mm -hmm. This is a book that's available right now, and um, what would you say to somebody who may be listening to you right now and saying, well, you don't understand the pain that I am dealing with, or actually maybe you do, maybe you do, but you don't understand my specific situation. How can Jesus really help my life? That's well, really true, and, and the, the, the problem is when we're in the middle of that, um, all we can see is right now, and all we can see is what we're feeling, and we don't always recognize that breathing is a gift and that life is 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 um short anyway and that we we only have a moment to do something good with what god's given us in this life and um and so what i would say to that person is i would say god created you in purpose he has plans for your life and um, there's something that you're meant to do with your dna and your fingerprints and that only you can do the way you can do it and, um, and I would I would pray that you would fulfill your highest calling and you wouldn't settle for less and you wouldn't you would be able to push through and, and find the glory on the other side. Josh, I want to ask you a question in a second, but first, Lacey, one other question. Before you said sin, I don't believe in sin. That's just the way that people will try to control other people. So that's make me go do it. How do you feel about sin now? Do you think that you have sinned? Oh, yeah. So you think sin's real now? Oh, yeah. And so part of coming to Christ is actually turning away from sin, repentance. Yeah. And that's real to you now. Yeah. I think, I think the, the way that we do that is to, what it says is the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And in my encounter with God, I saw that his love was there and available for me, mm. that he was ready to embrace me if I would let him. And the thing is, if you're holding on to something and um, you're holding on with all yourself to something, you have to let go of it all so that you can let him embrace you and receive the, 
the goodness he has for you. I believe sin is a poison that kills us from the inside out. Mm. We don't recognize it like cigarettes. We don't realize what's going on um, inside of us. Um, and I believe that the only remedy to that poison is Jesus, is the blood of Jesus Christ. So, so Josh, um, for people who might be listening to this saying, I, I, there's this person in my life that I love. I love them a lot. I don't know how to deal with someone who has these, these thoughts in their head that are so dark. Like, what, what, what went through your mind to say, how do I help Lacey? And, and what could you say that might encourage somebody to be Christ to them or bring Christ to them? I mean, that's a hard question, but I think the, um, one of the most important things is to sit down and listen to them really hear the depth of what's going on in their heart and mm-hmm. really hear why they're feeling what they are and don't just say well that's this or that's that and yeah. kind of disregard it really quickly you know in marriage i'm sure you know this it's it's about listening and communicating and if christ is if we're the bride of christ it's about communicating with him you know and so when we do that with other people and we hear their problems we hear their hurts um i think just even them just saying it out loud sometimes is a healing process which is weird you know i know your wife likes your wife likes to talk to you, and as long as she knows that she's heard, then sometimes her problem solved. You know, yeah. and so it sounds like a simple thing. <laughs> it, it sounds like a simple thing, but you know, I think that's the, the first place it starts because there's there really isn't one answer that just covers everything. It begins in that conversation. You know, and to show them that you really love them, you care about what they are going through, you understand it. Um, I'd say that's the beginning. You know, and from there it can go a lot of different ways. But that that's awesome. That's awesome, and um, you never know somebody's story until you've walked in their shoes or you've given them an opportunity to to tell you their story. And like you said, um, sometimes people, um, they just need to to download what's going on, the pain and the suffering. And and I think that as you are someone who listens to your wife uh, or you listen to a family member or a friend, they're seeing a reflection of, of what... Christ has done in your life, and that you are a, a vessel of kindness, of mercy, of forgiveness, um, someone who cares. And and sometimes that, like you're saying, is exactly what someone needs. And that can be the portal to point them to the cross, where they can find deep inner healing, and they can become a brand new person. Well, uh, as much as I love seeing you both sit here together like this, um, Josh, I know that you want to get some guitar stuff ready because Lacey's going to go sing another song. So uh, that's awesome talking with you. Thank Thanks you. so much. <laughs> Lacey, would, would you, you also do some work with the Whosoevers. Would you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, a long time ago, um, I think it was a couple years ago now, um, the, the bass player from the Deftones, his name's G, he was in a car wreck and he went into a coma and the money was running out they were keeping him alive in this in this hospital and and the money was running out and they needed help um the band had to the band also needed to continue to make money so we had to end up going on tour without him and, and um it was a really hard process so so um ryan reese who um who is a pastor over at calvary chapel costa mesa um, he was, uh, he has a crazy testimony of how God delivered him from mm-hmm. drugs and, and all this stuff. And, and Sonny from POD, um, they decided to get together and, and ask artists to pray for Chi and to actually donate. And one left for Chi.com was where you could donate. And, um, we actually were able to help the family, um, in a lot of ways and pray for them and, um, we saw a lot of great miraculous things happen through that, but then through that situation, we would put on events for the youth and go and tell our stories together. Me, Brian Head Welch, and Sunny Sandoval from POD, and then Ryan Reese. And we would put these free events on with loud rock shows in the middle of the city so all these people would come. And, um, and then we would tell what God did in our lives, and that's what the Who Service was. So we're, we care about helping teens that have heart issues and tell them how we overcame. That's awesome. Haven't you enjoyed listening to these two? So if you have a loved one who's struggling with these kinds of thoughts of depression or suicide, 
uh, anxiety, and you're wondering what to say to them, or maybe if that's you and you're looking for some place, a place of help, why not start with this book, written by a lady who likely knows exactly what you are dealing with. Uh, Lacey's book is called The Reason, How I Discovered a Life Worth Living. Well, Lacey, um, I know you have another song to sing, and it happens to be called... The Reason. The Reason. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here, come on over. I'm all yours. 